I can tell you this is the, a parent's worst nightmare. How do you go to your very brilliant children who love to go to school that they can't go again because mommy and daddy can't afford to keep them there? I am a TV producer. I also uh, host an indigenous language talk show. I actually have two shows on African magic. I produce and host one, and then I produce, I just produce the other. I've always known I was going to be involved with TV as far back as when I was like eight. There's something about women on TV that have always pulled at me. Um, my first exposure to that was uh, Lola Alakija of Blessed Memory when she does her thing on NTA 9 o'clock news. And then there was Onyeka Owenu. When she came back, the first thing she did was present uh, hosts, a present or something in Anambra State. And then I discovered Oprah. And back here in Nigeria again, there was Fumi Yonda and Wonder Woman Mo Abudu. Those women had always had impression on me. There's something so powerful about them. But when the opportunity came, like 40 years later, to be part of that, of that industry, I was the most unprepared person for that. My passion and desire did not equal success in that space. And... Um, I actually found that in a very hard way. Next slide, please. So, what was the initial idea or project? Okay, the original plan, just like Pinky and the Brain, for some of you that are old enough to remember them, <laughs> the idea was to take over the world. <laughs> you know, create this beautiful, premium, indigenous talk show that can compete side by side with any talk show in English anywhere in the world, both in picture quality, audio, story, everything, content, and use it to not just tell your story the way you want to tell it, but also to use it to show your people who they truly are so we can all go out there and smash the world. And we actually did that to a large extent. Everybody that came in contact with our show or that experienced our show agreed that it was a beautiful one. When we, when we were still uh, recording the first season, the first 13 episode, African Magic launched the Igbo channel. So we, we took the, um, a short clip of that to go and meet the lady responsible for buying content for them, acquiring content. When she saw what we have, just a, a, a very short clip, she couldn't max her excitement. She, in fact, she on the spot acquired the program. When we launched, when we had our um, private screening, a few weeks before the show was uh, premiered on African Magic, and we invited some people in the industry, Obie Melonye, all of us know Obi Melonye, the great movie guy. He said something to us. He said, your show is going to be the best on that platform. And he was right. He said again, very soon, your show is going to be the, um, what's his name again? Larry King show for the Igbo community. That everybody that comes on your show is made. And he was serious. He wasn't sweet talking us. But <laughs> that was in 2015. This is 2019. <laughs> what they all forgot to tell us is that we needed to run this thing like a business in order to be able to sustain it for impact. And that was the beginning of our sorrows. Next slide, please. 
Yeah. So African Magic did buy the show, the first 13 episodes, and they paid in hard currency, dollars. We were so right, we have hit the jackpot. <laughs> so, and the Igbo viewing community went crazy when the show came on air. Everybody on Africa Magic was like, who are these people? How were they able to do this? This is an Igbo show, but it's so international in this quality. We were in our zone. And based on the success of the show, few weeks after it was premiered, they called us again to do a four-part Christmas special of the show that will run through the four weeks of December of that year, 2015. Of course, we knocked that one off the park. We have found it. We have it. It was so beautiful. It was, it, we went all the way. And when we delivered, the overall channel head at that time, they said she kept saying, who are these people? I need to meet these people. How are they doing this? And of course, what it meant is that the value for what we have has gone high. We demanded for more, and they paid. So we quickly put together a season two. This time around, a 26th episode of the program, instead of 13. And um, we quickly ran off to African Magic, and it was yet another dollar ring. But then, that was early 2016, recession. Dollar was getting scarce. But who cares? We have a dollar-making baby. So we started spending. The company's money was our money. Our money was the company's money. Who owns the company? Us. <laughs> so we needed a befitting office space for us and our staff. We are doing such an awesome job. So we need a matching lifestyle. So more spending spray. <laughs> then, but because we are not irresponsible people, we quickly put together another 26 episodes, now season three, and off again to our beloved African magic. And shocker number one, there are no more buying in dollars. Shocker number two, they cannot afford to buy now. What just happened? We have salaries to pay. We have rent to pay, both for the home and the office. We have overheads and, of course, those minor details like school fees, <laughs> feeding the children, clothing them, and those other obligations you have as adults. And let me remind you that at this point, we have systematically became a one-customer company. We have basically abandoned every other aspect of our business and everything we were doing before now to focus on this dollar-making child. So to call the long story short, they eventually took pity on us and bought our most expensive... I didn't tell you, that season three, we took it all the way. It was beautiful, the set, the costume, everything. We, we went an, an extra mile. So now our most expensive and most beautiful episode, uh, uh, season was bought for just a little bit tiny fraction, smallest part of what they have bought from us all this other time. So the spiral fall has begun. And then... Walked in 2017, the horror story went into full swing. Salaries were piling up. Landlords were calling. Some vendors we've engaged, hoping that by the time they pay, we will pay them and move on with our lives, were calling. At this point, when my phone rings, my heart skips like two steps. When a knock comes on my office door, I get very apprehensive. And then the staff member started leaving. 
for every one of them that walked into my office and say, Ma, I have to go. I can't afford to come to work again. I have found something else. Became a validation of me as a failure. Forgive me. <laughs> please, can I have the next slide? Yes, next slide, please. So, I have gathered people's children <laughs> and I've exposed them to unnecessary hardship. I have let them down. They have lost confidence in me as a leader. And of course, we started selling things. We sold everything, including the cars, hmm. until there was nothing else to sell. Hmm. Then, at this point, we had to move ourselves to work hmm. using taxis and Ubers. But we couldn't sustain this for a very long time. So it got to the point where we are pushed to taking public transport to work. Wow. That is the infamous yellow buses. Right. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Nobody in this world have the ability to make you feel as worthless as Lagos conductors <laughs> and their drivers. I can tell you that. <laughs> it was such a humiliating time in my life. Sometimes I get to the office, I am so sad, I am so drained, both physically and emotionally, I am so depressed that I couldn't do anything. And then there's another round of meeting them again on your way back. Then, by the last quarter of 2017, we couldn't even afford to keep our children in school. Of course, by that time, quick notice also came. And we were about to get, become homeless, which actually happened for three weeks. We couldn't afford to keep our children in school. And how do you, I can tell you this is the, a parent's worst nightmare. How do you go to your very brilliant children who love to go to school that they can't go again because mommy and daddy can't afford to keep them there? How do you begin to explain that to them? But I will tell you something else that is even more heartbreaking. When your child, who is obviously very hungry, comes to you and says, Mommy, I am hungry. And you have no freaking idea what to do or where to go. Because those are shorting in your face faster than you could knock at them. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> you stop on. Yeah, please. <laughs> One day, I was middle of the night. Everybody has gone to bed. And um, I was lying at the couch at the back of my living room. And I was quietly crying my heart out to God. I said to him, God, all I need is just one break. No matter how tiny I will take it. Just one yes. Just one positive response. Because you see, at this point, we are falling so flat on our faces. And we still couldn't feel the ground. It was like... An unending abyss of darkness. And obviously, he heard. Because at this point, he inspired an idea in my husband, which at the time seemed most unlikely. But because we didn't have any other thing to lose, and the worst thing that could have happened is another round of news. So we presented it. And lo and behold, it was accepted, and that was our break.